Hi, this is Lane Weijers, engineer at Liberty Oil Food Services. I want to step you through uh, some fracturing concepts that are important in determining fracture dimensions. Two things that we can measure on location, net frac pressure and slurry efficiency. There are a variety of independent measurements that we can do to try to determine what fracture dimensions are without measuring these fracture dimensions directly. This problem is somewhat analogous to determining what the radius of a balloon is based on the injected volume in the balloon, the balloon's elasticity, and the pressure inside of that balloon. For a fracture, it works very similar. And from those balloon parameters, we can determine uh, the radius, hopefully given certain physical constraints and relationships. For a fracture, it works the same, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So there are things that we can measure uh, on location, for instance, injected volume, slurry efficiency, some properties of different rocks, and the net pressure inside of the fracture to then hopefully determine what the length, height, and width of the fracture are. That's ultimately what we, in what we are interested in, to determine how we can optimize a frag design. Do we need more length or do we need more width? Do, are we covering a certain height with this fracture to cover different layers? Those are very important parameters that we want to know. And to, to know those, we need to measure certain parameters indirectly. The most important indirectly measurable parameter for fracture growth is net pressure. In essence, net pressure is the pressure inside of the fracture minus the closure stress. Illustrated here by this cartoony picture where you can see the pressure inside of the fracture about 2500 psi and a closure stress pushing this fracture closed of about 2000 psi. That means there's a net opening pressure of 500 psi that is responsible for creating fracture dimensions. That's the pressure that we want to know and that's the pressure that ties to fracture dimensions, especially fracture width. How is net pressure related to fracture width? Let me go back to the balloon analogy you saw in the first slide. Let's assume we have a pre-existing flaw in the rock or a, a, a balloon that has not been inflated. What we assume is constant here in this fracture is that the length of this fracture, this flaw in the rock is not changing. The only thing that we're gonna change by applying pressure is the width of this fracture. If I plot the relationship of width versus pressure on the graph below, I will see that if I don't pressurize the fracture enough, the fracture is just simply not gonna open. The width stays at zero until I get the pressure to a, to a level of the closure stress in the rock. Then at some point, if I can increase my net pressure above that closure stress in the rock, you will see that the fracture width will grow linearly as a function of the differential pressure of the fracture pressure and the closure stress. And we just defined that in a previous slide as the fracture width being proportional to the net pressure. So that's why net pressure is so important because in this simple example where we have no length or height growth, the fracture width is directly proportional to the net pressure. So there's a good relationship between the net pressure and one of the dimensions that we wanna know. The next concept I would like to discuss is slurry efficiency. Slurry efficiency is of vital importance because it tells us something about the volume of fluid in the fracture. And since we already have a relationship between the pressure and the width of the fracture, now this helps us tie down the length and the height of the fracture. And that's because volume is equal to the, the width of the fracture times the length of the fracture times the height of the fracture. So by tying down width through a net pressure equation, we can tie down length and height further by understanding what the slurry efficiency is at any given time. Now, the definition of slurry efficiency is given to the right. Efficiency is simple, the volume of fluid in the frac divided by the volume of fluid that was pumped. Now, this is a, a relationship that is true for any time during the frac job, but we're mostly interested in what that slurry efficiency is right at the end of the frac job. So, if we have an independent way to determine what that slurry efficiency is, we know how much volume we've pumped, we can actually determine what the frac volume is at the end of the pumping cycle that we've just done. Now, the impact of that is if you have a low slurry efficiency, it means that probably during the time of the frac job, a lot of fluid has leaked off into the formation 
and not a lot of volume is left to create fracture dimensions. If you have high slurry efficiency, like in a typical shale frac, most of that fluid has not leaked off. Maybe only one or two percent of the total fluid volume has leaked off. And the 98 or 99 percent of the fluid that we pumped is still within the fracture to create fracture dimensions. But again, slurry efficiency with net pressure, probably the most important parameter to tie down what the volume is of the fracture and through relationships of net pressure and width, we can help it, uh, the slurry efficiency can help to tie down the length and the height of the fracture. One of the nice things about fracture diagnostic injections is that we can determine net pressure and slurry efficiency at the end of the job by just performing one measurement during a decline analysis. Typically during a decline analysis, uh, following say a DFIT, diagnostic fracture injection test, we can instantly determine the ISIP, an instantaneous shut-in pressure. In addition to that, if we wait several hours during a DFIT in the shale formation, we can also hopefully highlight when fracture closure occurs based on a different slope in the decline due to a change in the compliance of the fracture and a change in the surface area that is responsible for leak off. Once we've identified that closure point, we can simply determine the net pressure at the end of the job from the difference between the ISIP and the closure steps. Fluid efficiency can be determined in a slightly different way using the same point of closure. For a very simplistic equation of the slurry efficiency, the end of job slurry efficiency, it's equal, roughly equal in a very simplistic way to the total time it takes for the fracture to close after the ISAP has been measured, divided by the time it takes to pump and for the fracture to close. So with this very simple pressure decline data analysis, we can determine two parameters that are vital for pressure history matching and pressure analysis. Slurry efficiency and net pressure. These two parameters, like no other parameters, can give us constraints for fracture width, length and height that can then be used in more sophisticated models. Now this was Lane Weyers at Liberty Oil Field Services. For more information about this and other things that we do at Liberty, visit us at libertyfrac.com. Thank you.